Good evening and welcome to Mysteries of Bible Prophecy. I won't be able to say that too many more nights here. We have tonight, Friday night, Sabbath morning, Sabbath night. And our Mysteries of Prophecy seminar here will be finished. Now, I have been trying to negotiate with a nearby Adventist church where we can have follow-up meetings because I'm going to actually be here on the Panay Island for the up until mid-June. So we may be able to work out where once a week we can meet at a local Adventist church and I can do some follow-up meetings, but we still are negotiating that, so I can't make an announcement about that yet. Maybe tomorrow night we'll be able to announce something. But we welcome you, those of you who have been here faithfully for almost five weeks. How many have been here from the very beginning? May I see your hands? Oh, quite a few of you. And those that are listening on HCBN Radio 101.9 FM, we welcome you. We're going to start here in our site with the quiz from our last meeting. And if you're listening on the radio, you can do the quiz as well. Take out a piece of paper. Those of you that are watching, you can also pull out a piece of paper and do the quiz with us. This is from our last meeting Tuesday night, the mystery of financial prosperity. Those here in this site, anybody need a quiz card? If you do, hold your hand up. They'll pass one to you. Yes, there's a number of hands. We have helpers here that will place a quiz card in your hand. Just keep your hand up. Our first question is true or false. The tithe is our money that we give to God as a gift. Is that true or false? Write the answer on line one. The tithe is our money that we give to God as a gift. Number two. What percentage of our income is considered the tithe? What percentage of our income is considered the tithe? You have to write down there a percentage. Number three is true or false. God pr pronounces a curse upon all who willfully choose to rob him of tithes and offerings. Is that true or false? God pronounces a curse upon all who willfully choose to rob him of tithes and offerings. Number four is a multiple choice question. To where should we bring our tithes and offerings? A, to the bank for our investment. B, to the church to finance the work of the gospel. C, to the market to purchase our necessities. A, B, or C, to where should we bring our tithes and offerings? And the final question, true or false, God promises to richly bless those who return a tenth of their increase to him along with their offerings. Is that true or false? God promises to richly bless those who return a tenth of all their increase to him along with their offerings. Let's now review. Those of you that are listening, you can, we'll give you the correct answers. Question one, true or false, the tithe is our money that we give to God as a gift. Is that true or false? That is false. The tithe is whose money? That's God's money that we return to him. We don't give God tithe. We return tithe. Number two, what percentage of our income is considered the tithe? Ten percent is tithe. That's what belongs to God. If you want to give God a gift, an offering, then it has to be beyond 10%. Number three, God pronounces a curse upon all who willfully choose to rob him of tithes and offerings. Is that true or false? That is true. If you want God's curse, just don't return tithe and offering, either willfully or neglect. And the promise from God is you will have his curse. We don't want that. Number four, to where should we return our tithes and offerings? A, B, or C? B. B, to the church to finance the work of the gospel. And number five, true or false, God promises to richly bless those who return a tenth of their increase to him along with their offerings. What's the answer? That is true. How many got 100% on the quiz? 
All right, looks like most of you did. I hope those of you that are listening on the radio got 100% on your quiz also. And those of you that are watching, we will sing this hymn as they pass the baskets. You can drop in your quiz card with your score and your questions. We'll answer questions tomorrow night. Final night of questions, at least here at Robinson's. While they collect the quiz, we'll sing Under His Wings. If you know this hymn, then join me as we sing together. Under His wings I am safely abiding Though the night deepens and tempests are wild Still I can trust Him I know He will keep me He has redeemed me And I am His child Under His wings Under who from his love can sever? Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Under his wings what a refuge in sorrow, how the heart yearning Often when earth has no balm for my healing, there I find comfort and there I am blessed. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever? Under his wings, my soul shall Precious enjoyment, there will I hide till life's trials are more. Sheltered, protected, no evil can harm me. Resting in Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Under His wings, under His wings, who was one of my wife's favorite hymns. She's not even here tonight. She's down there with the children, and I know that some of you have been taking your children down to the children's program every evening. They tell me, my wife and daughter tell me they've had about 150 kids every night down there learning the truths of the Bible and learning Bible texts to music. And we have some students that have been working with us, and they've been helping out the children, and they also have learned the text. In fact, I believe the children have learned the entire Ten Commandments to music. I don't know if we'll get to hear them sing that, but those of you that are parents, then you will no doubt have been listening to them sing. Here is the website where you can go and download our recordings. Now, it won't be the particular recordings here. This will be what we did a year ago in Davao. But you can watch something that's very similar. We have MP4 videos there at the website. You can also get MP3 audio. Here's the website, afdavaorevelation.org. And you can also download our lessons along with other supplemental reading. That's all available at the afdevourrevelation.org website. So if you'd like to have some material, more than what you got here, or at least to have the digital files for what you had here, then you can get those there at the AF Devour Revelation website. 
Those of you that are doing all the lessons, if you still haven't completed them all, you can ask at our table for the missing lessons you haven't done. We'll be giving out diplomas for those who get all the lessons done Saturday night. Uh, we'll have a baptism this coming Sabbath, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, March 31. Where's the location? <laughs> well, I'm still not sure. I hate to say that. But they are, uh, I guess there's a couple options that we will be announcing tomorrow night. We'll tell you exactly where it'll be tomorrow night. Yeah, but we think it's going to be, I'm pretty sure it's going to be in the ocean. And there's plenty of ocean around, so we'll have a place where there's enough water for a baptism. We learned that a Bible baptism, you have to have enough water, plenty of water. So you go out to the ocean, there's plenty of water. What's coming up? Well, thank offering. We're going to do a thank offering again Saturday night. So if you've been blessed by the Mysteries of Prophecy Seminar, then you can give a free will gift Saturday evening to help cover the costs of our expenses. And tonight, tomorrow night, Saturday night, those will be our last night meetings here. Well, I think so. I don't know where the, where the follow-up will be, but... We'll announce follow-up hopefully also tomorrow night. Tomorrow night our topic is the mystery of the last night on earth. That'll be an interesting study. Then Saturday morning, Sabbath morning, 10 o'clock right here. Our topic will be God's mysterious washing machine. God has a washing machine. We'll find out what that is Saturday morning, Sabbath morning. Then Sabbath afternoon we'll be having our seminar baptism. And I know there are a number of you that are looking forward to baptism. We have visited with you, and I might mention, if you would like to be baptized Sabbath, and we haven't yet visited with you, please come and talk to us. We don't plan to baptize anybody that we haven't visited with. We have a kind of a clearing sheet that we go through, and we review the Bible teachings that we, as Seventh-day Adventists, believe are biblical. And we review that with all those that are going to take the step of baptism or rebaptism. And I know there are a number of you, you've gone through that process. But if you haven't yet and you'd like to be baptized Sabbath, then be sure and talk to us either tonight after the meeting or tomorrow. We can meet with you. In fact, I already set up on my calendar. I got an appointment tomorrow to meet with somebody who wants to be baptized. So if you'd like to be baptized and you haven't yet visited with us, then see us after the meeting. We can make accommodation for that. Saturday night will be our last lecture series in our mystery series, The Mysteries of Heaven. We save the best for last. Tonight's topic is possibly the most shocking topic, so we save that for last also. But before we study it, let's sing our theme song, and I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Our dear Heavenly Father, tonight we thank you for the wonderful face of Jesus. And that we can look into that face and forget about the pressures, the problems, the cares of life. We know, dear Lord, that you love us. We believe that demonstrated on Calvary's cross. We know that you have a glorious future in store for each one of your children. Tonight, as we study some of the devil's deceptions at end time, we pray you'd make the topic clear, give us willing hearts to accept truth, guide our evening study tonight. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. Our topic for tonight, Modern Mysteries, Magic, and Miracles. 
On May 13, 1917, three children, Francisco Marto, age nine, his sister, Jacinta Marto, age seven, and a friend of theirs, Lucia Santos, age 10, were tending sheep near the Portuguese village of Fatima at a place called the Cova de Ira. Suddenly, they saw a flash of lightning, lightning above a nearby oak tree, and a moment later, a beautiful, shining woman appeared above the tree. Do not be afraid of me, said the shining woman. I won't hurt you. I am from heaven. Lucia asked the shining woman what she wanted. The lady replied, I want you to return to this same spot on the 13th day of the month for the next six months, and then I will share with you who I am and what I want. The shining woman also asked the children if they would be willing to offer themselves to God to endure all the sufferings that he might wish to bring upon them in reparation for the countless sins by which he was offended and in supplication for the conversion of sinners. I might clarify, to make reparations for means to make payment for. Who paid the penalty for sin? Jesus did, but the shining woman at Fatima is asking the children to pay, or at least partially pay, for the price of sin. Lucia said that they would be willing. Then, said the shining woman, you will have much to suffer, but the grace of God will be your comfort. The children then saw rays of light beaming from the lady's open hands. The lady admonished the children to say the rosary every day, to earn world peace in the end of the war, World War I, and then suddenly she disappeared. The next month, the children did return to the Cova de Ira, to the same spot. This would be June 13, and a few curious adults came with them. After waiting about 15 minutes, suddenly Lucia pointed to the sky. She said, look, there comes the lady. And sure enough, as the adults watched, the boughs of that oak tree bent down, although no human hands were touching them. And at the conclusion of the encounter, the adults were convinced that the children had been conversing with none other than the Virgin Mary. And they spread word far and near. Word spread rapidly throughout that, throughout that area of Portugal. And so the next month, July 13, remember every month, 13th day of the month, July 13, 5,000 people went out to the Cova de Ira, there, to, there near Fatima, to see the shining woman. This time, the shining lady shared a secret with the three children. With strict instructions, they were not to reveal the secret to anyone. The secret of Fatima. Not a secret anymore. She also promised that on October of that year, October 13, she would work a miracle whereby all might see and believe. Before we look at the miracle that happened at Fatima, Portugal, on October 13, 1917, I'd like to first establish a biblical foundation from which to view the topic of modern miracles, magic, and visions. Let's consider some questions today. Are all visions from God, or can the devil also give visions? Is the devil trying to masquerade himself in some of these things that are happening? Some of these apparitions, some of these miracles. Can the devil work miracles? Oh, yes. How about uh, can he heal people? Is all healing from God or can the devil also heal? The devil can also heal. As you study God's word, you discover that there are actually two great forces at work in our world. There's God's power, but there's also the devil's power. And both these forces are miracle working. God works miracles, but the devil can also work miracles. God heals people, but the devil can also heal people. God gives visions, but the devil can also give visions. He gave one to Jesus, remember? You can read it in Matthew 4. He took Jesus up on the mountaintop. And get, then gave him a vision of all the kingdoms of the earth and their glory. The devil can give visions. And the question that we have to answer tonight is who, which of these two powers is behind the flood of miracles and apparitions and visions that we're seeing in our world today? We're going to answer that question tonight. And another question we're going to answer tonight is how can we know whether a miracle is from God or the devil? Before we answer that question, let's start our study with this question. Are there counterfeit gifts of the Spirit? Yes. Let me give you a text. Those of you taking notes, you can mark this. 2 Peter 2 verse 1 says, But there were, what? False prophets also among the people, even as there shall be 
false teachers among you. Prophets and teachers, those are both gifts of the Spirit. So here we have counterfeits, false prophets, false teachers. Actually, the devil has a counterfeit for every one of the true gifts of the Spirit. There are false prophets. There are false teachers. There are false healings. There are false miracles. There are false tongues. Oh, yes, there's a huge counterfeit in the Christian world today on the gift of tongues. We actually have a handout on that. I don't know if they're going to have it available tonight or when it is, but we have a handout on that one. But here's the question. Do these counterfeit gifts, do they look false? No. For example, suppose I were to develop a counterfeit 1,000 peso bill. To make my counterfeit effective, I have to make it look like what? Like the genuine. And the closer I can make my counterfeit look like the real thousand peso bill, the more effective I can be at deceiving people. Now remember this. The devil is a master counterfeiter. He has been practicing for 6,000 years. And it is impossible if you're just using your human senses of sight, sound, so forth. It's impossible for you to tell whether a miracle is from God or the devil. Whether a vision is from God or the devil. Whether a healing is from God or the devil. You can't tell just using your senses. There is only one way you will be able to know. And what is that way? By the Bible. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the genuine that the only way we can know the difference is by the word of God. Jesus warns us to beware of counterfeits. Let's read that warning. From Matthew 7, verse 15. Open your Bible tonight, please. To Matthew 7, verse 15. And when you get to Matthew 7, I want to invite you to put a marker. Put one of your ribbons. You should have two ribbons there in your Bible. Put one of those ribbons here in Matthew 7. Because we're going to return to Matthew 7 later this evening. Matthew 7, verse 15. And if you have the Seminar Bible, the page is there. That's a New Testament page. Do you need the page numbers anymore? No? <laughs> You're getting pretty good with the Bible after five weeks of turning to those places. Matthew 7, verse 15. Jesus says, Beware of, of what? Of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Sheep's clothing. In the Bible, in the New Testament, a sheep is a symbol of what? Sheep symbolizes a follower of Jesus. You can read that in John 10. But here, Jesus says that there are wolves in sheep's clothing. These false prophets, they come looking like sheep. Now, this guy here in our picture, our graphic picture, he didn't hide too well. But these wolves, these false prophets that come in sheep's clothes, they're going to look exactly like sheep. They're going to be inside the fold. They're going to profess to follow the shepherd Jesus. They're going to be inside the church. But inside of them is which spirit? The spirit of the wolf. And I personally believe that many of them, they don't even realize the spirit that controls them, the spirit that possesses them. They think, they believe themselves to be spirit-filled Christians, but it's the wrong spirit that's filling them. We're going to find out tonight how to know which spirit is filling them. There are multitudes today that are deceived, deceived by miracles. They're deceived by what's happening, the supernatural things that are happening in the world. And Jesus outlined there would be lots of deception. In fact, come with me. Leave your ribbon in Matthew 7. And let's go to another text in Matthew. Matthew 24, verse 24. Why will these false prophets deceive so many people? Here's the answer. Matthew 24. 24. That's an easy text to remember. Matthew 24, 24. Jesus again speaking says, Matthew 24, 24. Are you with me? You still, are, you, are you there in Matthew 24? Okay, let's read verse 24. Jesus says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That would be God's people. Great signs and wonders, miracles apparently. A lot of people have the idea, if it's a miracle, it must be coming from God. 
No, not every miracle comes from God. The devil can work miracles. And so the big question for us tonight is how can I know? How can I know whether there are miracles from God or from the devil? Let me give you a test. I hope you'll mark this in your notes. This is Isaiah 8.20. Isaiah 8.20. We have to test them by the Bible. Here's our test. To the law, Ten Commandments, and the testimony, that's the rest of the Bible, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If there's no light in them, what spirit is within them? The spirit of the, of the wolf. They have, they have a spirit, but it's the wrong spirit. So here it says, to the law, Ten Commandments. And the testimony, the rest of the Bible, if they don't speak in harmony with this, then there's no light in them, and we sure don't want to follow darkness. Here are two tests we can use. We have the law and the testimony. Let's begin with the testimony as our first test, the testimony of God's Word. That's a pretty broad test. There are many truths, many teachings, many precepts that we can find in God's Word that we can test people with. We can test the visionaries. We can test the healers, the faith healers. We use God's Word as a test. Let me just give you one example of a Bible teaching that we can use as a test. From the word. And that is the Bible teaching of the state of man in death. What do the visionaries, what do the faith healers, what are those who claim to have apparitions from God or from saints, what do they believe about the state of man in death? Do they believe the dead live on? Do they believe that we can communicate with the dead? What does the Bible have to say about the state of man in death? Well, if you've been coming to our seminar, you already know the answer to what the Bible has to say about the state of man and death. Let's do a bit of review this evening. We learned the Bible teaches that, number one, the dead are asleep. Psalms 13, verse 3, Job 14, verse 12, John 11, 11, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Daniel 12, verse 2, 53 texts at least, the Bible tells us, the dead are asleep. Number two, the Bible teaches the dead are in the grave. Jesus said so, John 5, 28 and 9. Peter said so, Acts 2, 29 and 34. We also learn the Bible teaches the dead know not anything. Where was that text? Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6 and 10 and Psalms 146, verse 4. And we also learn the Bible teaches the dead do not return to their homes. Job 7, 9 and 10. And Job 16, 22, that's what the Bible teaches. Based on what the Bible teaches about death, let me review this question. How many of the wicked dead are burning in hell or purgatory right now according to the Bible? The answer is none or zero. Nobody is burning in hell now. We learn from Jesus, Jesus' teaching, Matthew 13, 37 to 50, Jesus says, Hellfire will not burn until the end of the world after the resurrection of damnation. So we could actually add that as the fifth point. The Bible also teaches hellfire is not burning now. In fact, Jesus himself made that clear. Which brings us to the question, what about the visions of hell then? Have you heard about the visions of hell? People have had visions of hell. They've actually written books about the visions of hell. We know one thing. Those people that are getting visions of hell, who's giving them the visions? God or the devil? The devil is the one giving them visions. And <laughs> those visions are pretty sensational. But they don't meet the test of the scriptures. And so since they don't meet the test of the scriptures, we know they're not coming from God. To the law, to the testimony... If they don't speak in harmony with this word, there's no light in them. The Bible teaches the dead are asleep, the dead are in the grave, the dead know nothing, the dead do not return to their homes, and hellfire is not burning now. We're going to find out later tonight why we have reestablished these Bible truths. To the law, read with me, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8, verse 20. 
Well, we looked at one test, the, law, the, the, the testimony, the Word of God. That's a broad test. I just gave you one example. We could use many. But we, I gave one example of a Bible teaching that we can use to test the visionaries, the faith healers, those that claim to have gifts from God. There's another test, though, and that is the law. We test them by the Ten Commandments. What do the visionaries, what do the faith healers, what do those who claim to have gifts of the Spirit, what do they teach concerning God's law? Do they teach people to keep God's law? Or do they teach people it's okay to break God's law? And if they teach people to keep God's law, how many of the, of the commandments? Well, let me ask my, I don't know, is this a dumb question? How many commandments are there in the Ten Commandments? say, that's a dumb question, Pastor. Every church, almost every church in this area thinks you need to keep nine commandments. But how many are there? There are ten commandments in the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says in James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of how much? He's guilty of all. Here's the point. Anyone, preacher, faith healer, visionary, whatever, who is living in willful disobedience to God's law, the Ten Commandments, is not using God's power. They're using some other power. Let me give you a text that shows us this. You can mark this, and I would hope you mark this in your notes today. And I encourage you to take notes tonight, because we're going to look at some things you'll want to have in your notes. Acts 5, verse 32 says, And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, that's the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to who? To them that obey him. The Holy Spirit is given to who? To those who obey God. So, coming back to our point, any person, preacher, faith healer, visionary, or anybody who is living in willful disobedience to God's law, the Ten Commandments, is not using God's power, not using the Holy Spirit's power. They're using some other power. We'll see that in a moment. So we test them by the law, to the law and to the testimony. Have you noticed how God is continually, he brings us back again and again to his law as a test, as a standard? From the very beginning of the devil's rebellion against God in heaven, the central issue in the great controversy between God and the devil has been over obedience to God's law. The devil hates God's law. And there are some Christians, yeah, Christians, who also hate God's law. And if you think that sounds strange, I have experienced it. As I've traveled around, I've actually met Christians that have a hatred for the law of God. And you wonder why. Where does that come from? The devil hates God's law. And there are some Christians that hate, God, hate God's law too, especially when you talk about the fourth commandment. To the law... And to the testimony. There's two tests. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So those are the tests you want to use when you want to know whether the miracles from God or from the devil. To the law, are they keeping the Ten Commandments? To the testimony, the rest of the Bible, if they don't speak in harmony with this, then they're not using God's power. Based on that, let me answer this question or ask you this question. Can the devil work miracles? Well, we all know the answer, but let me give you a Bible text to support the answer. Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14. Last book of the Bible. Revelation 16, 13 and 14. And we'll give you a Bible text to show that, yes, the devil can work miracles. Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14 says, John says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils doing what? Working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So we have the spirits of devils doing what? Working miracles. Can the devil work miracles then? Yeah, the Bible says so. But it says there are three unclean spirits like frogs. 
Why does God say these three unclean spirits are like frogs? To answer that, we have to answer the question, what's a frog like? You have lots of frogs here, especially after the rain. What did you hear? I don't know if you heard the chorus after that big rainstorm we had the other day. The frogs were singing. Let me ask you, how does a frog catch his prey? With his tongue. I couldn't catch much with mine. You realize that today the world, including the Christian world, is being taken captive by tongues. Tongue speaking. Tongues are now manifest in most of the commandment-breaking churches of the world. There is a spirit at work in these churches. They're speaking in tongues, and they claim this is a gift from God. I say, well, I'm going to test it. And I'm going to test it with what? What? With the Bible, to the law. Do they believe in keeping the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath? I remember I had a couple of ladies come to me after I presented the Sabbath topic. And they were giving me the reasons why you don't need to keep the Sabbath. And I was answering them. They were getting irritated. And so I said to these ladies, I said, ladies, why do you hate the Sabbath? They said, we don't hate the Sabbath. We just don't like you putting us back under the bondage of obedience to God. I thought it was obedience to God, bondage. I mean, if you don't love God, yeah, it is. It's like being married to somebody you don't love. That's bondage. But when you love Jesus, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then these ladies, they said to me, they said, oh, pastor, let, let, let us ask you a question. Do you have the Holy Spirit? I said, yes, I believe I do. You know what their next question was? Do you speak in tongues? They didn't believe in keeping the Sabbath, keeping God's law, but they claimed they had the gift of tongues. I knew right away who was giving that gift to them. Tongues are now manifest in most of the commandment-breaking churches of the world. But it says they go out of the mouth. These unclean spirits, they go out of the mouth. That's where tongues come from. Go out of the mouth of the dragon. What's the dragon? The dragon symbolizes paganism, the devil. Did you know there is a tongues-speaking, miracle-working movement in the pagan religions of the world? Hindus are speaking in tongues, working miracles. But they also go, to, go out of the mouth of the beast. We learned here in our seminar, the beast of Revelation 13 is a symbol of the Roman church. Did you know that there is a tongue-speaking, miracle-working movement today in the Roman church? It's amazing. It's happening. But they also go out of the mouth of the false prophet. The false prophet is apostate Protestantism with all of its false prophecies. There's a tongue-speaking, miracle-working movement today in the Protestant churches of the world. Something is wrong when you have pagans and Romanists and Protestants all speaking the same tongues, working the same miracles. There is some master spirit that's stirring in all these religions, but it isn't the Holy Spirit. That's at work. The Bible says they are the spirits of devils. What are they doing? Working miracles. Are those real miracles? Oh, yes. The devil has supernatural power. He can make people sick. Who made Job sick? Go read Job chapter 2, verse 7. It was the devil that made Job sick. Now, I should clarify. Job is sort of an exception. Generally, God protects his people. But Job was sort of like a demonstration. God allowed the devil to afflict Job. He made Job sick, and it wasn't imaginary sickness. It was a real sickness. However, a person, if a person is not completely surrendered to God in every area of their life, then the devil may have access to them. He may make them sick. So they go to a faith healer, and the faith healer, you know, he puts his hands on them, and they fall over, and they get healed. And people say, oh, this is the power of God. I say, well, maybe, but I want to test the belief of the faith healer to see what power he's using. I remember we were doing meetings some years ago, and there was a lady coming to our meetings. She had been healed of breast cancer. She told me the story. It was a, quite a story. She said that she had, she had this big ulcerous cancer on her breast, and they had tried all sorts of therapy, the regular therapy. Nothing worked. So one day she said she was sitting in her tub at home, soaking in her tub. And she said she just felt like she ought to ask God to heal her. So in prayer, 
She put her hand on that cancer, that, that large ulcerous cancer on her breast. She put her hand on it, and she said she commanded that cancer to leave her body in the name of Jesus. She said, I felt this tingling sensation in my breast, and she said that cancerous, that ulcerous cancer began to shrink, began to shrivel. It shrank up. It dried up. It got loose like a big scab. And she says, I reached down, I pulled on it. She says it came right off, and it had two roots, just like the two fangs of a serpent. She was healed of breast cancer. You couldn't deny the fact. It was a medical fact that she had been healed of breast cancer. That lady was a Pentecostal lady. She learned about the Sabbath in my seminar and felt she didn't need to keep it. She had the Holy Spirit. She knew that because she'd been healed. So it was unnecessary to keep the Sabbath because she had the Holy Spirit. She refused to obey God in keeping the Sabbath because she had the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you, if the devil can work a miracle to keep somebody in a commandment-breaking church, you think he'll do that? Of course. That woman was confirmed in a commandment-breaking church by a miracle. And the devil will work miracles to keep people in commandment-breaking churches. I knew right away the power that healed her wasn't the power of God because she was disobeying God and unwilling to obey God. So she was healed, but it wasn't the power of God that healed her. You might be wondering, what are some of the miracles that will be wrought at end time by these three unclean spirits, like frogs? Let me give you an example of some of the miracles. Back in Revelation 13, that's just back a few pages, Revelation 13, 13, and 14. We just read from Revelation 16, 13, and 14. Now let's go back to Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14. And here we'll see one of the miracles that will be wrought at end time that will be used to deceive multitudes. Revelation 13, 13 and 14. It says, He doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the, side of, in the, on, on the earth in the sight of men. So here's a miracle. Fire coming down from heaven. And verse 14 says, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of what? Those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. How is the world being deceived at end time? By miracles. And one of the miracles is bringing fire down from God out of heaven. Where else in the New Testament do you read about fire coming down from God out of heaven? Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. You had the fire coming down from God out of heaven, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, you have the genuine Holy Spirit. In Revelation 13, you have a counterfeit spirit, counterfeit fire. And what we are seeing today in the Christian world, we're seeing a counterfeit spirit at work. We're seeing revival. You cannot deny that there's a revival spreading in the Christian world. You cannot deny that miracles are happening in the churches of the world. People are speaking in tongues. Miracles are happening. But what's interesting, the spirit that's being poured out on all these churches is not teaching the churches to obey God, not teaching them to keep the Sabbath, not teaching those Christians that they ought to take care of their bodies and not eat things that are unclean and drink things that are unhealthy. So either God no longer cares what I eat and drink and what day I keep holy, or this is a huge outpouring of a counterfeit spirit. Not a spirit from God. You decide which it is. We see, we cannot deny that there's a counterfeit. How close will the counterfeit look to the genuine? So close you can't tell if you're just using your senses. And as you look at what's happening in the Christian world today, you would think that this is genuine. But when you test it by the Bible, you say, this is not from God. I promised you I was going to show you a video clip of what's happening in some churches. I want to show that to you now. This is a very famous Faith healing to keep fire. Whoa! Ah, fuck Belba. Fire! 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 fire. Whoa! <sighs> Look at that girl. That's glorious. Fire on ya! Fire on ya, kid. Look 
at this on your young people. Look at this anointing on your young people. That is counterfeit fire. When I read in the New Testament of people that fall on the ground and writhe on the ground, that's not Holy Spirit possession. That's demon possession. And if you were to talk to Benny Hinn, he would tell you you don't have to keep the Sabbath. Did you know that Benny Hinn is communicating with the spirits of the dead? That is a fact that he admits. He even tells about that. So we know he's not living in harmony with God's word. We know then the power that is at work in his seminars. He has these huge crusades. Thousands come. People are healed. You can't deny that. But you recognize the power that's at work in his meetings is not the power of God. It's the other power. The Bible says, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by what? By those miracles which... Which test should we use? Should we test them by their miracles or shall we test them by the Bible? Which test would you like to use? Mark this. Many Christians today, they've turned away from the Bible as the ultimate test of truth and they are using tongues or miracles as a test of whether you have the Holy Spirit or whether you are true or not. That's dangerous because the devil can duplicate every one of the true gifts of the Spirit. And if you're just following your senses, you will be deceived. Here's a question. Is it possible for someone to think they are using God's power, like Benny Hinn, think they're using God's power, but instead to actually be using the power of the devil? Is that possible? Let me read with you probably the most shocking thing that Jesus ever said. Matthew 7. You left your ribbon there, right? Go back to Matthew 7. We'll read verses 20 through 23. Matthew 7, starting with verse 20. You have your marker, your ribbon. It says, Matthew 7, verse 20, Whereby, Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. And by the way, one of the fruits of a Christian is obedience to God. Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. So that's one of the fruits. And then as you read on, verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. These would ob obviously be Christians because they are talking to Jesus. And Jesus says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. We'll come back in a moment and find out what God's will is. Verse 22, Jesus says, Many will say to me in that day. By the way, many, is that the minority or the majority? That's the majority. Jesus says, many will say to me in that day. So these would be Christians. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Whose name did they prophesy in? They did it in Jesus' name. They say, we prophesied in thy name, Lord. We spoke in tongues in thy name, Lord. We healed people in thy name. I remember years ago, I was doing a seminar like this in Ukraine. We had a, a hall about this size, and it was full every day. We'd, and we had two off days, just like we've been having here. And there was a very famous faith healer there in Ukraine. This was a lady faith healer. She, would, she had rented the same hall we were using on the two nights that we had off. We had big crowds, and she had even bigger crowds. And then during the day, she had rented an office there in the hall complex, and people would come by. They'd long up, line up in long lines, and they would go in and visit her, and they would pay to be healed. Well, one night after my meeting, I walked off the stage, and I went to my room. They had a little room where we would store our sort of, sort of our baggage. We have a supply room here. We had a little supply room there. So I went to my supply room, and when I walked in the room, here was this faith healer. I guess she wanted to meet an American. So she was there with her business, her financer, and we greeted. And then she said to me, she said, uh, Pastor, she says, I want to know what you think of my power. I said, well, I don't profess to be judges of people's powers, but I said, I can ask you some questions. She said, go ahead. I said, well, uh, are you a Christian? She said, of course, I'm a Christian. I said, fine. I said, you believe in the Bible? She said, yes, I'm a Christian. I believe in I believe in the Bible. In fact, he said, I do all my miracles in Jesus' name. Everything I do, I do in Jesus' name. 
Now, to this day, I don't know why I asked the next question, but it came to me, so I asked it. I said, do you believe that there's a devil? She said, no. There is no devil. I don't believe that there's a devil. Well, I knew right away. If she didn't believe there was a devil, she didn't believe what book. She didn't believe the Bible, because the Bible makes it very clear there's a devil. And I had heard some of the things that she had been doing in her healing sessions, and it didn't sound very Christian to me. It sounded more like the witch doctor. But anyway, she said she was doing it all in whose name? In Jesus' name. And so here Jesus says, many, they're going to come to me. And they'll say, Lord, we prophesied in thy name all these things we did in thy name. Reading on, verse 22. Jesus says, in, in thy name have cast out devils. They cast out devils in whose name? In Jesus' name. You have to have supernatural power to cast out devils. You can't do that in your own power. And they did it in whose name? In Jesus' name. I was doing a seminar in the same country, Ukraine, different city. And I had a man tell me a, the most amazing story. He had been attending a church sort of a Pentecostal-style church where they would deliver people from demons. They had a deliverance ministry at this particular church. And he said one time they told him that he had some demons that needed to be cast out. He didn't know this. But they assured him that, yeah, you have some demons that need to be cast out of you. So he said they finally convinced me to allow them to pray over me. And he said they took me back to this side room. He was telling me the story took me back to this side room, and he said, a group of these Christians, they gathered around me. They all put their hands on me. They began to pray that God would deliver me from the demons. And he said, I felt this strange sensation come over, over me. She's, he said, I lost all my power. I fell down in the midst of them. And then he said, the devil started going out of me. And he said, every devil, as it went out, it sounded like a gunshot. And he said, there were so many demons in me, it sounded like a machine gun going off. All these demons going out. And then he said, a great fire went out of me. I don't know if that was the biggest devil or what. But he said, a great fire went out of me. And he says, I was delivered from the devil. And then he said, those Christians, they kept praying over me. He says, oh, the holy, the holy anointing of God came down upon me. He got so excited it was, as he was telling me the story. He started speaking in tongues. Now, you understand, this was in Ukraine where they speak Russian. So my translator, this was all being translated to me. My translator, he turns to me. He says, I can't translate that. I don't know what he's saying. When that man began speaking in tongues, the hair on my neck stood up. Because the voice that came out of his mouth as he spoke in tongues was the same voice I have heard twice in my life when I met people that were possessed of the devil. That was a demon speaking out of her, his mouth. Well, he calmed down after a few moments and began speaking Russian again. That could be translated. And he said, oh, pastor, he says, I feel impressed that I need to test you. He said, do you have the Holy Spirit? I said, yes, I believe I do. He said, do you speak in tongues? I said, no, I have to have a translator. Oh, then he said, you don't have the Holy Spirit. I said, now, wait a minute, brother. The Bible says the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. The Bible, you can read that, John 16, 13. The Bible says God's law is truth, Psalms 119, 142. We just got through preaching the night before about the Sabbath. So I said to him, I said, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit's given to those who obey God. I said, brother, let me ask you a question. Do you keep the Bible Sabbath? He said, the Holy Spirit told me I don't need to keep the Sabbath. Just about that attitude, too. Well, I knew right away that he had a spirit, but it wasn't the Holy Spirit. Now, don't misunderstand me. That man had gone to a church. He hadn't gone to a seance. He had gone to a church and thought that he had been delivered from the devil. But instead, he had gone to a church and he had become demon-possessed. There's a whole lot that's happening in the Christian world today that's not coming from God. And if the church that's, is disobeying God, breaking God's law willfully, then you know that God's power is not at work in that church. That man thought he had been delivered. Now, I've had people say, well, Pastor, the devil wouldn't cast out the devil. No, he doesn't. That man wasn't delivered of the devil at all. He became possessed. But he thought he'd been delivered. 
Jesus says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils? Matthew 7, 22. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. Verse 23. Now, this is shocking. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. If Jesus never knew them, whose power were they using? That's shocking. Jesus says many. Many using the devil's power. That is scary. And that is why we need to test everything by what? By the Bible. You say, Pastor, how are we going to know? Who really is using the power of God? Well, if you go back to verse 21, Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What is God's will? You can read the answer in Psalms 40, verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. God's will is that we keep his commandments. So any person, faith healer, visionary, whatever, that's breaking God's law willfully, they're not using the power of God. To the law, read with me, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now that we have established that Bible platform, let's return to the story of Fatima. We left off July 13, 1917. And on that date, Lucia Santos was given a vision by this shining being that claims to be the Virgin Mary. And this is what the shining being said to Lucia. You quote, you have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wants to establish devotion to my immaculate heart throughout the world. End of quote. Is that statement in harmony with the Bible? Not at all. You can begin to see who is working here. That was July 13. 5,000 people were there. It created a huge sensation. In fact, even the secular newspaper reported what had happened. And so the next month, <clears throat> August 13, 15,000 people went out to the COVID era to see the shining woman. This time, they saw a globe of light cross the heavens from the east and settle over the oak tree. The next month, September 13, 1917, Enthusiasm was running so high, 30,000 people went out to the COVID era. Again, they saw the globe of light cross the heavens from the east and settle over the oak tree. But this time, they also saw shining petals like snowflakes falling through the air. And the shining woman promised the next month she was going to work her miracle, whereby all would see and believe. The rain was coming down in torrents on the morning of October 13, 1917. And yet, in spite of the rain, upwards of 75,000 people went out to the Cova de Ira to see the miracle. And they were not disappointed. After waiting for some time in the rain, suddenly through an opening in the sky, the clouds parted a bit, and the shining woman descended. She conversed briefly with the children. And then she stretched out her hands toward the sun. And as the people looked toward the sun, they could actually look at the sun without it hurting their eyes. The sun paled. It turned into a silver disk in the sky. And then rays of color began beaming out of the sun in all directions, all colors, blue, green, yellow, red. And as the people looked at the sun, the, the sun began turning slowly on its axis like a wheel. And then it began to move about in the heavens. It began jumping back and forth in the heavens. And as the people were watching this sensation, suddenly it seemed that the sun broke loose and began to fall toward the earth. It got bigger. It got hotter. Now, if you think this sounds strange, upwards of 75,000 people saw this. It's a well-documented fact. Here's a photograph of part of the crowd there that day, October 13, 1917. Well, as people saw the sun approaching, getting bigger, getting hotter, they thought the sun was going to collide with the earth. And so they began to pray for help. But the Lord would save them. Who do you think they prayed to? Virgin Mary. 
And apparently in answer to their prayer, suddenly the, the, the vision or the miracle, whatever it was, ended. The sun went back to its place in the sky. The shining woman disappeared. The clouds went away. And the people noticed that their clothes, that had been, they had been soaked to the skin because of the rain a few moments before. Their clothes were completely dry. The ground where the water had been standing 10 centimeters deep in some places, the ground was also totally dry, an undeniable miracle. But the question is, who did it? Well, to answer that, let's consider some of the doctrines of Fatima and other Marian apparitions. Let me just share with you some of them. Number one, prayer and sacrifices for the dead. Here's a statement, again, from that shining being that claims to be Mary. Quote, pray a great deal and make sacrifices for sinners, for many souls go to hell for not having someone to pray and make sacrifices for them. End of quote. Who made the sacrifice for sin? Jesus did. Was his sacrifice sufficient? Yes, but not according to the shining being that claims to be Mary. Another doctrine of Fatima and other Marian apparitions, prayer for the souls in purgatory. Here is a statement from that shining being that claims to be Mary. Quote, pray for the souls in purgatory, end of quote. How many souls are in purgatory according to the Bible? There aren't any. In fact, you don't even find the doctrine of purgatory in the Bible. It's not there. Purgatory is purely a fabrication of the father of lies. Another doctrine of Fatima and other Marian apparitions, number three, communication with the dead. Here's an example. This is from the book, The Cult of the Virgin, Catholic Mariology and the Apparitions of Mary, page 132 and 3, written by Elliot Miller and Kenneth R. Samples. Quote, another troubling aspect of Medjugorje, that's a town over there in Yugoslavia where the young people are receiving apparitions of Mary, Another troubling aspect of Medjugorje is that some of the visionaries have seen, talked to, and even touched people who have died. In Ivanka's case, she embraced and kissed her dead mother on several occasions. During an interview, Ivanka described these encounters with her mother. I've seen my mother three times since she died. My favorite time was the last time she was with the Blessed Mother, Virgin Mary. My mother came over to me. She put her arms around me and kissed me. She said, oh, Ivanka, I am so proud of you. End of quote. Here's my question. Who hugged Ivanka? We'll come back and answer that in a moment. Reading on, same book says, this sounds very similar to the occultic practice of necromancy. That's talking to the dead. A practice that the Bible explicitly condemns. And you can see the text there, Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12, Isaiah 8, 19, 1 Chronicles 10, 13, and 14. The Bible tells us, he shall return no more to his house, speaking of someone who dies. Job 7, verse 10. Job 16, 22, Job says, I shall go the way whence I shall not return. When you die, you're going to come back. Not going to come back and visit the living. The Bible told us, let's read this together again. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Ecclesiastes 9.5. So based on the Bible, who hugged Ivanka? Here's the answer from the Bible. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. That was a demon masquerading as her mother. The Bible says the dead know how much? They don't know anything, so that couldn't have been her mother, according to the Bible. She was hugged by an apparition of a demon claiming to be her mother. To the law, oh, there's that wolf, the wrong spirit. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, then there is no light in them. Let me read on from the same book. The Cult of the Virgin, Catholic Mariology and the Apparitions of Mary, page 129, which says, Because of the unbiblical nature of Marian apparitions, if the cause is supernatural in origin, then we can only be dealing with the demonic, not with God. I realize that this line of reasoning will be offensive to many Catholics. 
Nonetheless, I believe it is a necessary theological inference, and I would agree with their conclusion. The Bible itself says Babylon. We learn that Babylon is the mother church that sits in the city of seven hills, along with all of her daughters, all those commandment-breaking churches. Babylon, the Bible says, God says, has become the home, the habitation of devils. And you can see how the devils are at work in the Christian world today. People think these are miracles from God. But we realize they don't meet the test of Scripture, so they must be miracles coming from the other power. The Bible says in Revelation 18, 4, Come out of her, come out of Babylon, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. God does not want us attending church where demons are working. And so God causes people to come out of Babylon, come out of those fallen churches. Who then is behind the apparitions and miracles of Mary? Now you know. It is shocking, yes, but it is the truth. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Here's my question. Is Mary in heaven or in the grave? Based on the Bible. Now, don't misunderstand me. Mary was one of the greatest. If there ever was a great saint, it was Mary. We're not degrading Mary at all. She was a great saint, the mother of Jesus, no question. But the question is, is she in heaven or in the grave? Biblically speaking, she's in the grave waiting for the resurrection. There is a very interesting text in the Bible that I'd like you to mark in your notes tonight. And that is from 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, which says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into what? Into an angel of light. The devil has always wanted to be worshipped. He knows that he'll never get people to worship him if he appears as a, a red monster with a pitchfork and a tail, looking like a goat. You might get a few Satan worshipers to worship that, but you're not going to get the masses of the world to worship that kind of thing. However, if the devil were to appear as a shining woman, a woman revered by most of the world's religions, Roman Catholics, many of them, they revere Mary, some worship her, the Orthodox Church, over in Eastern Europe, they venerate Mary. Many worship her. Protestants now are beginning to venerate Mary. Islam venerates Mary as the mother of the prophet Jesus. Much of the world venerates her. The devil knew if he could get the world thinking that this is Mary. He could get the whole world to worship him. Mark this. The shining woman that's appearing in various parts of the earth today claiming to be the Virgin Mary is none other than the angel of light of 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. That's who it is. And this being has said that if necessary, she will appear in every home to prove to people that she exists and that they should worship her. Are you ready for that kind of deception? Deception so strong as to almost deceive the very elect? Are your feet so solidly anchored in the word of God that you're not going to be swept away with the devil's delusions? I hope so. Base your faith on God's word. The Bible says, read with me, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The word the Bible teaches, number one, the dead are asleep. Number two, the dead are in the grave. Number three, the dead don't know anything. Number four, the dead do not return to their homes. Number five, hellfire is not burning now. The shining woman that's appearing in various parts of the world claiming to be Mary is teaching the exact opposite. So we have to choose the Bible or the apparitions. I've made my choice. How about you? I've made my choice to follow God's word, to base my faith on God's holy word, the Bible. Jesus says, read with me, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Yes, I know this is shocking for some of us. 
The truth sometimes is shocking. Sometimes it hurts. But God never sends the truth to hurt us, but to save us, to save us from our adversary. And as long as you follow Jesus, you don't have to fear the devil. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you. That's Jesus. If you've surrendered your life to Jesus, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's our enemy, the devil. If you've committed your life to Jesus and you're committed to following his word, you need not fear the devil. Would you like to ask Jesus tonight to help you base your faith on the Bible? How many want to ask for his help to base your faith on his holy word? Let me see your hands. We're going to end our meeting by singing this grand hymn, Give Me the Bible. Star of gladness gleaming to cheer the wanderer lone and tempest tossed. Let's stand as we sing this for our closing hymn tonight. Sing with us. Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer. Lord and tempest tossed, no storm can hide that peaceful radiance beaming since Jesus came to the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and law combining. Till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible. That lamp of safety or the gloom shall brighten. That light along the path of peace can show. heads as we pray tonight. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Holy Bible. We thank you for Jesus who has given us his word. We pray you'd help us, Jesus, to follow truth, to follow you, to base our faith on your holy word. We've raised our hands tonight to ask for your help. That we might be anchored in your word. Bless each one here to that end, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you tomorrow night for the last night on earth. God bless you.